Johnson for another installment of Another Way to View Reality. Uh, I'm Emelina Pedigo of The Show Goes on Productions. I am writing a book called uh, Another Way, The Tao of Artist Development, and I coach artists in development. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Nikki again, who is also writing a book. And today, well, Nikki, you want to give yourself a little introduction? Sure. Yeah. So thanks again for having me and welcome everybody who's uh, joining us again. So I'm Nikki Johnson. I'm a writer, speaker and discussion leader. And I'm actually writing two books. So first one is Self-Realization Science, uh, The Anatomy of Enlightenment. And the second one is The Internal Process of Enlightenment, Bridging Spirituality and Science. And so today's exactly. subject is, uh, is Nikola Tesla and his work on free energy. So basically the transmission of, um, or, or the wireless transmission of electrical power. So. Yeah, cool. And I'm excited to hear your take on this because I know this is very polarizing. Tesla himself was a very polarizing individual. So there's, um, I've never fully understood it. So I'm excited to hear and learn more about what this whole free energy thing is all about. So lay it on us. Okay. So yeah, I figured, you know, uh, two things that I just wanted to say right off the bat is definitely, yeah, Nikola Tesla, his work and his life in general definitely is a polarizing subject. You tend to see in uh, sources, both mainstream and alternative, you know, one of two camps. So basically people either see him as this absolute angel who was defenselessly, um, you know, screwed over by evil villains, or he's a complete fraud and his ideas, especially toward the end of his life, were just, you know, completely ridiculous. And so- um, Sounds like Elon we, Musk. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Entrepreneurs. Oh, you know, and, and that's, that, that's a great point. I think that, you know, the dynamic with these figures who were so large, um, then you have the, the full swing of polarity from light to dark, you know, and you can yeah. see all these different views. So, so that, that's a great analogy, actually. Yeah, cool. But yeah, I, I think, you know, the real story is probably somewhere in between these polarized extremes. So at the end of the day, all of the historical figures that we're going to be talking about in terms of Tesla's story, you know, all of these were real people and we all have a light and a dark side. I mean, this is just mm. the human condition. Yeah, so. well put. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that, that's one thing that I wanted to say. But the other thing is, you know, particularly when we get into the free energy section, these are some, this is a complex subject. We're going to get into some pretty, pretty heavy concepts. And so, you know, if you don't get it right away, don't feel bad. That's actually normal. <laughs> so, um, but, keep, <laughs> Thank you. But, but keep at it because, yeah. you know, these ideas are associated with the, the next paradigm. So kind of to put it in the context of what we've been talking about in our previous episodes. So in terms of 3D, so the realm of consciousness kind of associated with the lower chakras um, and material reality. You have 4D where you're starting to explore more psycho-spiritual issues. Um, and then 5D, which is next paradigm type stuff. So um, this would be one of those 5D ideas. This is this is the next paradigm. This is once we go beyond the, the crown chakra and, and that sort of realm. Um, and if you wanna, we can think of it as dimensions or if you wanna just think of it as planes of thought, if that feels more comfortable to you, feel free, you know, but, but that's what we're talking about here. So, so right. even just the act of studying these ideas and trying to wrap your head around it and being able to sort of conceptualize these things. This is a very productive activity because that helps you to align to that, mm. that next realm. So definitely. Cool. Okay. So, but you know, above all, similar to what we've been saying in, in most of our episodes, you know, just, just try and keep an open mind about these things and definitely question the narrative, including the one that we're feeding you tonight. So right. we'll, in, we'll include some links um, from both of these different polarized extremes and people can decide, you know, um, where they, they want to fall in terms of that spectrum. Cool. So. Yeah. And I would definitely encourage people if they want to put in the comments, kind of what they know, because I think uh, people, 
heard of Tesla? Nikola Tesla is not an unknown name. People kind of know, you know, that he was an inventor, but I, but I don't think people realize a how polarizing he is and all of this stuff. So I'd love to hear from people about that as well, about where yeah. they land on all of this. Definitely, very cool. So. Yeah. Okay, but before we dive specifically into his free energy work, I think it would be helpful to set up more of the general background to kind of set up the mm -hmm. story first. So, okay, so Nikola Tesla, he was a Serbian American inventor, electrical and mechanical engineer, and a futurist. So, definitely way ahead of his time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So he held at least 278 patents for a variety of different inventions, but he was generally best known for developing a rotating induction motor for alternating current, which is the type of electricity that powers the vast majority of homes and businesses today. Okay. Um, so Tesla was born in a city that is located when it, in what is now Croatia, but at the time it was still part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, his father was actually a priest of the Serbian Orthodox Church. Wow. Oh, interesting. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And, and so at age 17, yeah. Nikola almost died of cholera. But during this time, he pleaded with his father that if he would be allowed to study engineering, he might live. <laughs> instead of uh, instead of pursuing the um, sort of careers that his father had in mind for him, which was either theology or a career in the army. So anyway, his father agreed, and then he made a miraculous recovery. So thank God. Mm, that. That's a little um, tricky. So he's showing intelligence very early on. <laughs> totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Right. So um, Tesla had what is known as an eidetic memory. So this is actually a step up from a photographic memory where you can just recall things as they were in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, with his memory, he could see things in such vivid detail that it was like they were actually sitting there. And we'll kind of get back to this point a, a little bit later. Um, but he could also do integral calculus in his head to the point where his teachers just assumed that he was cheating somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, he learned eight languages very easily. Wow. Um, but the interesting thing is he did not graduate from college because in his second year, he lost his scholarship and then supposedly he developed a gambling problem. <laughs> so, right. yes. Um, his first job was with the American Telephone Company in Budapest in 1882. And unfortunately, he suffered a nervous breakdown during this time due to hypersensitivity to sounds, light and vibration, and also mm -hmm. just... Uh, acute sensitivity to all sense organs. And you know, it's interesting because this has led many people to believe that he probably was a high functioning autistic. Mm. And, you know, because at the time that autistic spectrum certainly hadn't been developed. Um, and this seems to be highly probable because he also had a number of obsessive compulsive disorders or tendencies that kind of fit that profile as well. Mm -hmm. One other thing that I want to add on, on this point is, um, you know, this type of condition, this really informed his work. And so, um, you know, he's famous for saying, uh, if you want to know the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. And so th these nice. are things that, yeah, I love that quote. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, and these are things that he had really direct experience with on in on on a visceral level. Right. And so, um, but there was also a, a second quote that I wanted to share, which is really fascinating. So, at one point he said. A long time ago, when I was a boy, I was afflicted with a singular trouble, which seems to have been due to an extraordinary excitability to the retina. Now, if you recall from our pineal gland activation episode, mm -hmm. we talked about the very close association between the retina and the pineal gland. So mm -hmm. these signals about the presence of light go through the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is basically the, bi the body's biological clock. Mm -hmm. They go into the pineal gland and this signals to the pineal gland sort of when to switch between different states of consciousness now for most people mm -hmm. they're switching between wakefulness uh sleep and dreaming 
Mm. But there's also a fourth state that the pineal gland is involved in, and that would be transcendental experiences. So mm. just keeping, yes. Fascinating. So just, of course. Yeah. So um, just keeping that in mind, let's dive back into the quote. So okay. Okay. it was the appearance of images, which by their persistence marred the vision of real objects and interfered with thought. When a word was said to me, the image of the object which is designated would appear vividly before my eyes. And many times it was impossible for me to tell whether the object that I saw was real or not. And again, going back to that episode and what we discussed there, you know, people with these transcendent experiences, you know, most of the time, these experiences feel more real yeah. than the everyday experience. Like a psychedelic experience. Psychedelic. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And near death experiences and, and all of these sorts of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of supersedes mm -hmm. that that everyday waking reality that we're used to. So yeah. anyway, I mean, based on that, it definitely sounds as though he was probably, you know, involving that pineal gland and through it, tapping into what some people have called the super conscious mind. So right. uh, which, yeah, and he, would, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, he also sounds a lot like an artist, actually, you know, mm -hmm. the plight of this artist, which is, you know, they say a lot of artists are driven kind of mad by, this this drive to pursue their art and he's had this crazy drive to pursue science you know to the point where he's pissing off his parents <laughs> you know <So> that he's <laughs> right. science versus nowadays it's like you piss off your parents when you tell them you want to pursue a career in the arts so yeah, and exactly. I've always said exactly. that, yeah I have that, that that scientists and artists are very similar in the way they think too because you have to have that kind of open mind to go to these unknown places in order to, especially invent, which is what he was. He was this inventor. He was he was tapping into this unknown place and maybe even channeling some of his brilliance. So it does sound like genius. It sounds a lot like genius. Totally, totally, mm -hmm. undeniably, I would yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> so, cool. yes. Now, um, he emigrated to the United States at age 35 with just four cents in his pocket. So. Um, also, like time, <laughs> I know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, he got a job with uh, Albert Edison or Thomas Albert Edison, um, in his Manhattan headquarters. And so, you know, these two men they had very different styles, very different personalities. So, Edison was very methodical very determined and also very commercially driven mm -hmm. whereas tesla was certainly as we said absolute genius yeah but also rather eccentric right and definitely more of a visionary than a business person right. so at one point he said you know money doesn't matter to me as much as it does to others all my money has gone into inventions to make man's life a little easier and so, you know, unfortunately, this type of idealism can make one pretty vulnerable in a capitalistic yeah. society such yeah. as ours. And I can certainly attest to this. And yeah. I'm sure our viewers can. Oh my God, that's an artist. That's the point. Uh, exactly. An artist. You no, know? yeah. Exactly. Fascinating. So, yeah, but um, there's one other set of quotes that I wanted to share that really plays into the differences between these two men. So, you may have heard of either one or both of these quotes. So Edison is known for saying that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% uh, perspiration. Whereas Tesla said uh, genius is 99% inspiration and 1% perspiration. And so a lot of this comes back to his eidetic memory. So he could imagine things so vividly that he could actually design his inventions in this mental space and he could even add little improvements he could test them in this space and then once he was satisfied with the way that it was there then he would create it in 
what we would consider to be real life. So right. three and 40 yeah. reality. Yeah. And, um, and then, you know, do the drawings and submit the patents and all this other stuff. Right. So misunderstood. Um, misunderstood. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So this 99% inspiration has to do with his eidetic memory and, and mm -hmm. this whole super conscious, you know, tapping into that realm. Yeah. Um, but definitely between these two guys, you know, you know, their personalities clashed. And so Tesla only worked for Edison for less than a year. And then they basically became business rivals for the rest of their lives. So right. Yeah. Um, there yeah, was a show on Netflix that I watched that I really loved called American Genius, which looked at these rivals, which uh, in business that have re that really drove innovation. So, you know, they looked at like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates versus Bill Gates and like Hearst versus Pulitzer. And they all had and Edison versus Tesla when they all had these rivalries that fueled them to push innovate because they both were brilliant. Edison and Tesla were brilliant in inventors. For sure. Right. For yeah. Sure. So yeah. that series, I'll put the link to the series in the in the in the comments, but it's no longer on Netflix. I think it's on Amazon Prime now, but it's a great look at specifically innovation and this idea of genius. So, um, so I know that they, they, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, that's part of where I think this polarizing aspect of Tesla comes in because of yeah. Edison, right? Right. Yeah. You did have the, the arch nemesis kind of a dynamic, which is yeah. played up in the, in the media too. Yeah. Sure. Right. Because that's what sells. Yeah. All right. So. Anyway, um, just some super quick background on, on Edison um, for the sake of our story here. So contrary to popular belief, Edison was not the guy who invented the light bulb. He was more like the mm -hmm. Steve Jobs of light bulbs. So mm -hmm. he was the first to create, um, you know, a commercially viable light bulb. The first one was invented in 1802 um, by a guy named Humphrey Davy, but it didn't last very long and it was way too bright for practical use. So, you know, in the decades that followed, a lot of different people worked on this problem. Um, and then Edison ended up kind of buying a bunch of different patents. And the one that he ultimately used to create the one that, you know, ended up mass marketing um, was by an electrician and his colleague named Woodward and Evans. And he made significant improvements to that model. And he filed his own patents in 1878 and uh, 79. And then in 1880, he established the Edison illuminating company, which is actually now General Electric, kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, and at that point, he started constructing all of these different electrical generating stations, again, to mass market that product. Okay. So, um, and actually, he opened the world's first central power plant in downtown Manhattan uh, on nice. Pearl Street. So, right around where the Seaport District is. So yeah. For everyone, everyone tuning in from New York, I'm sure you know exactly where that is. So. Yeah. <laughs> Really? Nice. nice. So now Edison's system was based on direct current. So this is where electrons flow in simply one direction. Now, the problem with DC current is that as soon as you try and send it for more than a mile, it loses a ton of voltage. And so Tesla, while he was working with Edison, he tried to sell Edison on the idea of a different type of electricity, so alternating current. And this is where the electrons just go back and forth like this. And, you know, with electricity, it doesn't matter which direction the electrons are going in. It's the movement that creates electricity. So, so AC and DC, that's direct current or direct circuit? Direct current and alternate current. current so yes. AC, DC. Okay, got it. Yes. Cool. AC, DC, for sure. Yeah. So, um, now, Tesla um, developed the induction motor um, with a rotating magnetic field. So basically, you have the, world, the poles of this magnet kind of spinning around, and it makes the electrons go like this, and that's how it creates um, alternating current. Now, the advantage with alternating current is that you can basically step up and step down through transformers to the amount of voltage. So, you know, on the power lines that are out there on the street, you can send super high voltage through those and then step it down so that people can safely uh, plug their appliances into it at home. 
Okay. So, um, so Tesla pitched the idea of alternating current to Edison, but Edison didn't go for it. He thought that it was too dangerous, too unpredictable. He thought that direct current was safer, and that's the way it was going to go. Now, Tesla also insisted that he could significantly improve the efficiency of Edison's systems. And Tesla claims that Edison bet him $50,000 that he couldn't do it. So mm -hmm. Tesla worked around the clock for months on this and he made significant progress. But when it came time to demand his reward, uh, Edison said, oh, that was just a joke and Tesla didn't understand mm -hmm. American humor which is terrible. And then so born the rivalry, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> rival for life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> threw Never a threw a man out of money. On that one. Yes, 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 yes. So instead, he offered Tesla a $10 per week raise and Tesla <laughs> promptly quit and became a ditch digger for a little while. Wow. I know, I know. That's how angry he was. Exactly, exactly. Well, why did Edison think it was so, alternating current was so dangerous? Or are you getting to that? He uh, thought all of Tesla's work was, or was it just the AC thing? Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess because it's not just going in one direction, you know, it's switching mm -hmm. back and forth. Something about that. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah. So anyway, um, but eventually Tesla raised enough money to found the Tesla Electric Light Company. And under this umbrella, he developed patents for all sorts of AC generators and wires and transformers and lights and, and the motor. Um, and he ended up selling these patents to George Westinghouse, who's a big investor, um, for... $75,000 in cash and notes, uh, a royalty fee for each motor, and then a job as a consultant. <laughs> and so, um, and then at this point, Westinghouse started um, setting about, you know, commercializing the AC system on a mass scale. And this began the war of the currents between AC uh, and DC. Mm -hmm. So, Westinghouse just started installing AC generators all around the country, focusing a lot of attention on these really little markets that, again, because DC current couldn't go further than a mile without losing right. a ton of energy, you know, it would have a really difficult time to getting into these really remote areas. But also, he would go into the larger markets, too, and just underbid his pricing. So in retaliation, Edison started a smear campaign where... This is so sad. He would round up stray dogs and cats and electrocute them. There was even an elephant in the Coney Island Zoo that was, um, I guess they were going to destroy this animal because it had injured a bunch of handlers. Uh, he electrocuted that one as well. And the point was he wanted to paint AC current as dangerous in the mind of the public. And so also, when the electric chair was put into effect uh, right. as part of capital punishment for the first time, mm -hmm. he actually colluded and made sure that it was AC current that was used again to right. paint it in the mind of the public as being dangerous. Wow, he was driven. Dude, <laughs> yeah, going all the way. Yeah. Now, the breakthrough for AC current and Westinghouse came in the form of two things. So, at one point, they got a contract to provide electricity to the Chicago World Fair in 1893. And then I think shortly after that, they got a contract to build a hydroelectric plant at Niagara Falls. And that powered a, a number of major cities. And so after that, that's when AC took the lead. And yeah. DC went into relative decline right after that. And basically, AC current is now what is used, again, to power the vast majority of homes and businesses throughout the world today. Okay, good. Um, that's what happens when you play dirty, Edison. Exactly. Karma's, <laughs> karma's a bitch. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, now, the remainder of Tesla's life tends to be increasingly polarizing, especially as you get closer and closer to his death. Yeah. And so, you know, you'll see the two sides arguing with each other about the facts with these like super emotionally charged debates where, you know, both sides are accusing each other of like, that's a lie. No, that's it's a lie. So, um, and you know, I think there are two factors that kind of contribute to this dynamic. So 
on, on one hand, you know, Tesla, again, would design a lot of his inventions purely in that mental space to spend sometimes years, you know, working out all of the kinks and adding improvements and testing these things in that mental realm without putting anything on paper or designing anything, you know, he's working it all out up here. Hmm. Um, the other thing is, okay, so... His lab burned down in 1895, and we won't get involved in whether whether that whether that was because of foul play or mm. a natural disaster or simply mm. because of the nature of the equipment that's in there and okay. you know all that stuff. We'll we'll just leave that. That's what happened. Okay. Okay. Controversial though. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Um, so, uh, but also his lab in Colorado Springs was torn down in 1904 and everything was auctioned off um, to pay his debts and we'll go into mm. why all that happened. Okay. But also Wardenclyffe Tower was demolished by the federal government in 1917. And then upon his death, all of his papers were confiscated by the feds. And those last two things were the for the sake of national security. And so, you know, again, we're not going to go, we're not going to speculate. That's just what happened. Okay. okay. Um, and by the way, so the guy who was asked, so they, they asked a, an engineer at MIT to look over the papers and decide whether there was anything useful in there. And the guy that was asked to do this yeah. was actually, get this, uh, John Trump. So this is Donald Trump's uncle. That's random. Small world. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, East Coast. So, yeah, anyway. But, yeah, um, interesting. Right. So anyway, for all these reasons, sometimes it's just difficult to, to nail down even the basic facts of his life. But we're going to try. Okay, good. So, okay. Now, for the remainder of Tesla's life, he worked on many different inventions. But ultimately, you know, his primary goal was was the wireless transmission of energy. Okay. And so in 1891, he gave a lecture to the American Institute of Electrical Engineers in NYC, where he held a glass discharge tube, so basically an early light bulb in both hands. And even though there were no wires, they were both illuminated brightly just in his hands. And people were obviously amazed at this. And he told them, you know, this was powered by two metal sheets on either side of the stage connected to a radio frequency oscillator known as a Tesla coil. Now, just to keep this simple for non-science majors, so a Tesla coil is essentially a device that converts low voltage power into high voltage, low uh, current power. Um, transferring electrical charge through induction. So this is when um, you have electrical charge passing from one component to another without direct contact. So cool. the Tesla coil, you've got a primary coil, a secondary coil, and then a capacitor, which stores the energy. Mm -hmm. um, and one key concept involved in the Tesla coil and just Tesla's work with free energy in general is resonance. So okay. uh, everything has a resonant frequency. So you, me, the planet, objects, everything, everything has a resonant frequency. And so um, in physics, resonance refers to the amplification of energy that occurs when you basically hit something with a periodic force, um, that matches the natural vibration of that object or that system. So you can think of it in terms of a swing on a playground if you're pushing a child, let's say. So, you know, if you hit it at just the right time, that swing goes higher and higher. That's what we're talking about. And so this is, this is the principle that's at work in cymatics and also with a tuning fork and also I don't know if you've ever seen those demos where you've got an opera singer and if they hit a certain right. note and you can yeah. get glasses to completely shatter. Yeah. It's ex cool. So that's, that's exactly what's at work here. So the okay. glass has a natural frequency. And so if you hit that note, if you hit that frequency, then it's going to cause the atoms in that glass to vibrate. Um, 
And so if you increase the volume sufficiently, the glass will vibrate so much that it actually shatters. Okay. So, yeah. Oh. Yes. Now, in, in uh, 1898, Tesla did something very similar with an electromagnetic oscillator, otherwise known as the earthquake machine. So this was just a little device. It was small enough to fit in an overcoat pocket, as he would say. And so one day, just working in New York, Tesla applied five pounds of air pressure to this piston on this little machine, and he nearly shook a steel bill building to the ground by matching its natural residence. Mm. So the police and the ambulance showed up and because everybody thought that an earthquake had just occurred. And meanwhile, he just like picked up his little device and like left the scene. Cool. <laughs> it's not <laughs> cool. Yeah. But um, now Tesla imagined using these vibrations in much more peaceful and productive ways. So essentially, here's the basic dynamic. So you have one device that converts electricity into vibration. You have that. Uh, that device sends the vibration to a second device. That second device converts it back into electricity, which then can be used to power things locally. And so that's wireless transmission of energy through this concept of resonance, okay? Okay. So, um, now at this point, he needed a different place to work because of the aforementioned incident. You know, he's, he's got to have room to- Everything to burns down. Yeah, instead yeah. of just causing a ruckus in the middle of New York City. Well, right. so, yeah. so a lawyer who had previously defended him in court named Leonard Curtis set him up with a facility in Colorado Springs. And this guy was also uh, an officer at a local power company. And so he got them this amazing, deal where they would provide power to him for no cost, which is just a, a really sweet deal. Yeah. So uh, for his experiments. Okay. Now, if you've ever seen the movie The Prestige with uh, Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman, yeah. um, test have you? No, okay. I haven't. But go oh, it's good. Yes. Okay, okay. I, I just watched it again a little while yeah. ago. But um, yeah, so Tesla is featured in this movie and his Colorado Springs facility, obviously, is the fictionalized version of him. But uh, but yeah, it represents him at that stage of his life, which is pretty cool. So um, now here in Colorado Springs, he built a magnifying transmitter, which is essentially a huge Tesla coil. And he conducted experiments here from 1899 to 1900. Now, there were two possible approaches that Tesla considered for wireless transmission of energy. So initially he was working on simply sending it through the air between the surface of the earth and the ionosphere. Um, this is actually where lightning strikes. And so it's been proven that electrical charge can be propagated around the world in this space um, between the surface of the earth and maybe 50 miles high. Um, which uh, in the area of ionized gas. Okay. And so today, uh, this area is known as the Schumann cavity. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Schumann resonance. No, I haven't. Anyway. Okay, so um, this is actually the resonant frequency of Earth's electromagnetic field. So you can think of this very loosely as the heartbeat of uh, Earth. So basically this pulse. Okay. okay. And so in, in 1952, a guy named Winfried Otto Schumann calculated this frequency as exactly 7.383 hertz. Now, 50 years earlier, Tesla had calculated the resonant frequency of the same area to be approximately 8 hertz. And this was back in 1899. So he was way ahead of his time on this one. Mm. Um, but basically, all life is a, on Earth is attuned to this frequency. We all harmonize with it. Uh, okay. Humans, organisms, everything. Um, and so, you know, there's a great documentary which we can include in the description called Resonance, Beings of Frequency. And so they go into um, some of the studies that Hans Bergen did, um, uh, specifically like looking at human brain waves and how they matched the that band, um, specifically the alpha wave, which is responsible, as we learned the other day in that event. Um, in con uh, oh, right. 
Right. So um, relaxation and feelings of comfort. This is where we go in meditation. You know, it's that realm. And yeah, it's interesting. Just, yeah. a, just a brief side note here. Yeah. 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 So uh, the fact that we tune into this um, in order to remain feeling healthy and balanced, you know, this may be one of the problems or one of the issues with 5G, that it interferes with our ability to do that, to remain uh, feeling healthy and balanced. So okay, I have a question for you, because I've heard you say a few times 5G. Now, what exactly do you mean by 5G? So this is the the new type of energy that all these uh, mobile telephone companies are putting in. So this will, right. this will okay. and and the argument is this will enable the Internet of Things. So all of our devices will become smart devices. You know, right. that, that's one of them and, and faster download speeds and all of these things. Right. Okay. The only thing is. It's untested in terms of its effect on human health and right. that's a concern. Got yes. it. But anyway, we're not going to get into that. Right. Okay. In, right. in this particular episode. Okay. I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah. Whatever. Um, okay. But uh, meanwhile, so Tesla noticed the existence of what he called stationary waves in this membrane of non-conductive air in that space that we're talking about. So and he, he uh, realized that he could produce the same types of stationary waves with a radio frequency oscillator with a Tesla coil. Okay. And so um, he filed a patent for this method in 1900. Okay. Um, however, shortly thereafter, Tesla soon realized that the transmission of electricity through the air would result in a significant loss of energy. And so instead, he started working with uh, a different concept. So sending energy through the ground, again, using the concept of resonance. Now, initially, this seems like a radical idea because ordinarily the ground is simply where electric charge kind of drains away. Um, but Tesla believed that if it were charged high enough, the ground could actually become a conductor by grounding only one of the poles. And actually, this is used today. So there's this method uh, used to deliver power to remote areas um, at very low cost. And so um, it's known as single wire earth return. It was developed by Lord, uh, sorry, Lloyd um, Mendero in 1925 for rural electrification. So when you have these really tiny areas, this is a way that we, they can reach them at really low cost. Um, but this is actually, so that's, that's the method of grounding um, just one of the poles and using earth as a conductor. But in that case, electricity is being sent through the ground. That's not what Tesla was trying to do. Again, if we go back to the explanation that we gave of resonance. So Tesla's model was, okay, you take one device, you convert that into uh, acoustic resonance, safe, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then you have a second device convert those vibrations back into electricity and use it locally. So that's his model. Okay. Interesting. Okay. But anyway, so, so Tesla found that um, Earth's uh, natural frequency could be made to oscillate. And by hitting it with uh, current waves of certain lengths, which were based on the diameter of the Earth, the globe could be thrown into resonant vibration with these sound waves forming stationary waves. So, so one night after months of experimentation, um, hoping uh, he fired up his machine at full blast, hoping to create this resonant rise. And so uh, basically started with millions of volts of electricity, converted that into vibrations and then sent that through the earth. And interestingly, okay, so one description of this described the ground as being electric blue. And that totally reminded me, I don't know if you were in town for that incident that happened. I think it was around Christmas of last year where there was a transformer explosion in Astoria and the the sky in New York oh, yes. had that were you there for that? Uh, yeah, I didn't see it, but I heard about it and I saw okay. the pictures and social yes, media. Yeah, super weird. That was super so weird, weird. But I mean, definitely electric because they're talking about that that color. Uh, yes, in the context of what that he was color. Doing too. <laughs> so, yeah. Interesting. But anyway, so so the returning current that he got 
was significantly weakened at first, but again, Tesla kept sending these, um, you know, uh, repeating periodic pulses. And this created a cumulative effect, this amplification of energy. This is the definition of resonance in physics, okay? So you amplify the initial wave um, by doing this. Okay. And so, yeah, the returning current came back and eventually it formed an arc of lightning that stretched, you know, 130 feet into the air. And it just created these apocalyptic uh, thunderbolts that you could hear from maybe 15 miles away, which is pretty interesting. Cool. So, yeah. yeah. But unfortunately, the power surge also knocked out all of electricity for all of uh, Colorado Springs and uh, yeah, and severely damaged the equipment at the El Paso Electric Company, which was uh, providing him with that free energy. Right. So, oh, no. Wah, wah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, the free power was, uh, I mean, they, they sued him for wow. not only the power that he had been using, but also the damage to all of his equipment. And so, yeah, unfortunately, I know. So that was the end of that. That lab was torn down in 1904 and all of his stuff was auctioned off to pay off his debts for this incident. So sad. Yeah. Anyway, so he returned to New York looking for funding. Um, And he was aware now that the business world probably wouldn't be jumping the idea of giving away free energy to the world. So he began pitching his idea. Yeah, there's no money in it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So he began pitching his idea as a means of transmitting radio communication uh, rather than electric power. Okay. Um, so George Westinghouse, the guy that hit the investor that had backed him up for AC current, right. um, he passed on the idea. But JP Morgan, uh, he did pick up the idea because he was he was all excited about gaining a monopoly on world communication. So um, this enabled Tesla to build a new laboratory on Long Island in Shoreham known as Wardenclyffe. And so now at this point, I just want to interject, dude, there's so much fierce argument on the internet about who invented radio, whether it was yeah. Marconi or Tesla or even some other people. Um, and I definitely do not want to get involved in that squabble yeah. at all. Got um, but just one thing I, w- I was going to say, you know, from what I see, Tesla Tesla was definitely involved in developing and patenting a number of radio-based inventions. First of all, the Tesla coil was radio-based. You also had these like remote controlled boats that he used to wow the crowds and kids with. Everybody just thought like, wow, is there like a monkey in there? How is he doing this? Right. Okay. And a number of other things. Okay. And, you know, maybe Marconi borrowed the ideas, maybe he didn't. That's where a lot of this debate is, but- um, Yeah, they were interesting times back then when all of these new, and it was just about who patented things first, first, which wasn't necessarily the people came up with the ideas. Exactly, this, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, this this sort of behavior was rampant back then. It was all about who could get the patent, yeah. Yeah, they covered that American genius a lot too. Oh, cool, Yeah. yeah, yeah, repeating theme for sure. Yeah. So anyway, but you know what? At the end of the day, the fact is, this just wasn't Tesla's goal. This is just what he told the investor that this project was about so that he could secure the funding. As sad as that is, you know, I think this is a relatable thing, though, for so many people, because how many times have you had this just idealistic goal, but the compromises that we all have to make in 3D and 4D reality to survive? Um, so, so it's the hardest play, you know, you compromise. It's like the nonprofit issue, too, where it's like you have to bend your mission when exactly. you're applying for funding to exactly. get the funding. It's also all about the finance financial side of things too, you know, to the investors and the people with the money and you have to, and they're not interested in these idealistic goals. So where, where's my return? Exactly. Yeah. And then poor Tesla just got stuck in the middle of all of these like (laughs) wars. What do you do? What do you do (laughs) when you have this visionary goal? Right. Right. So anyway, um, but by 1903, 
but to that point, uh, you know, Tesla just ran out of initial funding um, for his experiments and for all of this infrastructure that would be right. required, right. you know, for, you know, the setup. And then you have free energy after that. But right. there is a setup phase. Okay. Yeah. Um, so right. and, and he went back to J.P. Morgan and he asked for more, but turned it down this time because, you know, by this time, Marconi seemed to be farther along on radio communication and he was right. doing it a lot less expensively. Again, because this was not Tesla's primary goal. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Anyway, tough situation. So mm -hmm. now in 1917, the federal government demolished the Wardenclyffe facility, claiming that the Germans were using it as a radio transmitter or an observation post during World War I. So, mm -hmm. interesting. Okay, interesting. but anyway. So, yeah. you know, after all of it, what were the results? Okay, sadly, Tesla ran out of money before, before he could fully realize his dream with wireless transmission of energy. But he did, he was granted a patent in 1905, which was called the art of transmitting electric energy through the natural mediums. So oh, I love this. it. I know. Yeah. I knew you would. I knew you would. Yeah. I knew the viewers would too. Yeah. So yeah, cool. cool. But anyway, um, in this patent, he outlines what he was seeing, what he envisioned, his method for free energy transmission. And so, okay. But then again, you know, suspending judgment, let's just look at both sides. Okay. okay. So let's say that you're an investor. Where's the incentive for you to fund something like this from a financial perspective in terms of all of the initial infrastructure that needs to right. be built? Right. Okay. It's expensive. There's crazy accidents during these uh, experiments and stuff. But also, where's my return? Yeah. Um, and, and similar to electrical power lines and, uh, you know, the mobile towers. OK, there's there is a lot of initial infrastructure that needs to be built to have this to make this happen. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the case of those electrical power lines and the mobile towers, you know, you had investors and companies saying, OK, yes, I will do that. I will pay that upfront cost because I know that I will get that back and a lot more by, based on the services that I'm charging for. Yeah. In the case of an idea like this, in terms of what Tesla envisioned, you know, using the natural frequency of the earth, just amplifying that, kind of riding that almost like a wave, like a surfer yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, providing energy to people around the globe. Okay, from an investor perspective, uh, you know, why, wow. you know why, would I, why would I shoot myself in the foot? And that mm. simply is the situation. Mm, okay. Fascinating. It really, especially in today's perspective of, of the energy wars. Yes. You know? yes. 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 So that's where we are. And, okay. you know, putting yourself in that investor's shoes. Okay. I can understand why I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Why would I do that from a financial right. perspective? Okay. Now, at this point, <laughs> I just have to relate a personal experience. And, you know, honestly, people can think whatever they want to think about this experience, but, okay. and, and make up your own mind about what you think is true. But I'm just going to share what happened and how I think that relates to the work that I'm doing with the books and the, the research that I've been doing, how all this stuff relates together, and people can decide what they want to think. Okay. okay? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you and I originally shot this episode on Wednesday, so a little earlier this week. And, yeah. and oh, by the way, yeah. <laughs> so right after we finished shooting that, I went for my daily walk. And immediately when I turned the corner, there's a Tesla Energy van sitting there. So <laughs> random. I didn't even know that was a company. I didn't either. I didn't yeah. know. Now they provide batteries to Tesla cars. I, I, I looked it up. Oh, yeah. So amazing synchronicity. Yes, <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's interesting too that it just really quickly that Elon Musk is behind all these like Teslas because Elon Musk as a character reminds me so much of how you describe um, 
Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah. I wonder. I wonder. <laughs> I'm sure he's probably he did that on purpose. He probably knows all that, and I'm sure there's probably quotes and stories of him talking about Tesla. But that yes. is interesting. There's definitely a parallel there. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure he's. And, of it. and also, okay, so this story is one of those that falls in the bucket of this may or may not be true because this is one of those where people go, ah, that that's not true. That's a okay. lie. Okay. And then other people defend it. But anyway, no, there's a story that Tesla had an electrically powered car that he had tra- that he had converted from a Pierce Arrow, which was one of these like super early cars, right? Okay. And uh, it just had this little antenna, and it 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 uh, didn't need it didn't need any power. It didn't need you know all this stuff. It was just powered through this electrical antenna, and then the system connected with it, right? And so I'm sure. Elon Musk is, is probably at least aware totally. of that story. Yeah, yes. so. I'm sure there's more to that story. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Interesting. But anyway, interestingly, since we brought that up too, so the rest of the story goes that JP Morgan, when he saw this car, he said, well, if we can't put a meter on it, we don't want it. So again, going back to okay, yeah, where's, right? the, where's the financial incentive for this sort of thing? Hmm. But anyway, okay. So, um, you know, in that first recording that you and I did, I presented a summary of everything that I had found at that time. Uh, yeah. I was good about it, right? Yeah. Um, but then a few days ago, <laughs> I had an experience with an altered state of consciousness. And this was not, a, this was when I first woke up. This wasn't even induced by meditation or anything else. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so That's life. Yes. So I had an experience where it was just as though the boundary that separated me and everything else just kind of dematerialized and I could feel my direct connection with everything in my immediate environment. And like vibrationally was, speaking? Kind of like less, a- less vibrationally, just this sense of awareness that I am directly connected to everything. A oneness. Yeah. No, I, I've, I've certainly heard of this as an intellectual concept before, right. but feeling it on that cool. visceral level is a totally different thing. Okay. Yeah, radical. So what's crazy about this is that after that experience, when I thought back to the concepts that we presented in our first recording, I could suddenly visualize these things in a, in a way that I couldn't before end to end, you know, just the concept that he was applying, this mm-hmm. concept of resonance and his application of that and, mm-hmm. and see it in my own mind. The way he uh, did. In a way. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> who knows? Not with the but, level of detail, but the yeah. basic concept, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and, and yeah, you figure the pineal gland was probably involved in that experience. And that's what we were relating to that yeah. memory and, and tapping into the superconscious mind as well. So yeah, I think it is all connected. So good call there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So anyway, that's why we decided to reshoot this because, you know, after that experience, I had a lot of different perspectives about the whole concept and, and a better understanding of it and an ability to explain it in my own words so much better than I was able to before, which is yeah. really cool. Yeah. So anyway, um, but you know, clearly here's the point where, you know, this is going to be the leap of faith for people where, and again, everyone watching can make up their own mind about what they think. And they should. This, but yeah. Yes. But look, from my perspective, here's how I would interpret it. Okay. So it does come down to that concept of resonance that we, I think, mentioned earlier in, about being resonant with a particular piece of information. And then that's when it is able to appear in your view of reality. Okay. That's kind and of so- vision theory a little bit too, or like holographic universe anyway, where it's like you created it exists yeah so this is also the basis for the law of attraction right so yeah you become resonant with that 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 intention that right. thing right. and then it can appear in your reality so mm-hmm. absolutely um 
And so, yeah, it goes back to a lot of what we've been saying in these previous episodes about, you know, this concept in the context of information. So when I become resonant with a piece of information, well, now it can appear in my reality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of times um, what we see is for, for concepts that are not yet resonant with someone's current level of vibration, either one, it's just not going to appear anywhere that that person's like, and, and this happens for everyone. There's information that is way beyond where I am right now. And so I yeah. just, I can't access that. Okay. Yeah. So either that or yeah, it may come into your field or one, you just, even if you see it, you have, you can't understand it at all. Um, or you immediately dismiss it because it doesn't fit with your current worldview. You have to expand your mind in order to accommodate that mm -hmm. in, in the same way that cognitive dissonance often works. So, mm -hmm. so that's sort of really interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So in my view, and again, everyone can think whatever they want. The way that I would explain this is, yeah, it's just a matter of aligning ourselves vibrationally with this next paradigm idea, um, the timeline where this new future can take place, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and what's cool is that we've been given the opportunity with this lockdown situation, a lot of us to focus primarily on our own inner alignment right now, mm -hmm. of raising our vibration. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. You know, yeah. Most most of the usual distractions that we have in terms right. of the material world, a lot of that stuff has just been minimized right now. And so mm -hmm. yeah, that gives us gives us the ability to focus on this, which is pretty cool. So, you know. Tesla has outlined the method that he envisioned. Um, and so it's already there. It's just a matter of aligning to that yeah. possibility. And so, you know, as above, so below, as within, so without, you know, once you align with it internally, then it can manifest. Aloha, Ken. No, I know. This is really powerful. But, yeah. um, and I feel like this is what Tesla meant by if you want to know the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. He was talking about what he was inventing, but also this concept that we're talking about right now. So anyway, but that's the way I see it. And everyone can, you know, come to their own conclusion. Yeah. But also another thing that I wanted to add. So in researching this topic, I found a parallel thread that seems to fit what I'm talking about in terms of this last concept. So, you know, again, everybody can decide for themselves. But in one of the videos that we'll include in the description for, for our little show here, um, there was mention of Maxwell's quaternion equations and some serious editing of this work that is fully recognized um, to have happened in, in translating these to textbooks um, that have been circulated throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1861, James Clerk Maxwell, uh, he published four equations that basically serve as the foundation for electric di dynamics as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've used these laws to build basically everything in existence in terms of electrical systems and equipment and devices. And so, you know, this is the foundation of 4D technology as well as, you know, the way all of this stuff is taught to scientists and, uh, and electricians and, you know, everybody studying this throughout the world. Yeah. Okay? But in 1885, in transferring these equations to physics textbooks, a guy named Oliver Heaviside, mm -hmm. which is a terrible name. <laughs> you right. He's got pounded on the, on the playground for that. Um, yeah as a kid. But anyway, he removed all of these aspects from uh, Maxwell's equations that pointed to the existence of a fifth dimension because it was deemed too mystical. Mm -hmm. So it kind of reminds me of the Council of Nicaea 
in terms of religion, you know, kind of editing certain things from the Bible and we don't even know. In this case, we actually, I think we do have access to that stuff, but yeah. in terms of, you know, what was circulated and became part of um, the foundation of education and everything that we've built, it's been built on these simplified equations that leave all those things out. Right, right. Um, yeah, because history is edited by those in power and in control and just so you know we're heading we're coming up here on an hour uh whoa okay yeah, yeah. we're almost done here we're almost okay done. cool but anyway um so but meanwhile you know maxwell's original equations um unified electromagnetic energy and gravity and ever since though this quest for a uh, unified field theory or a theory of everything that kind of, right. uh, you know, reconciles this schism. You know, scientists have been working on this ever since, but it, it was there. So, right. uh, oh, anyway. Yeah. I mean, these but, you know, I, new. <laughs> right, 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 right. right. Yeah. So, but as I was looking this up and kind of heading uh, into various forums that were talking about this, now even some of the most skeptical electrical engineers, so people who, you know, aren't even remotely uh, receptive to anything that feels like conspiracy theory, definitely aren't interested in any of the types of subjects that, that I explore as well as science, you know, but spirituality and union psychology and philosophy or whatever. Yeah. Even these types of people, super, super science um, driven, you know, they look at, are starting to look at this question and go, wait a minute, what happened here? <laughs> like, right. why was that stuff edited out? Right. And so now there is one theory out there known as the Kaluza Klein theory, which was developed in 1921. And this does again uh unify electromagnetism and gravity and again it involves a fifth dimension and so cool, i'm cool, seeing cool, a pattern cool. here yeah good yeah awesome so anyway, um, yeah but in terms of you know just the polarization of, of views i'm kind of reminded of just what morpheus said to, to neo that you know those who are really entrenched in that system of of 3d reality you know they're the ones who are ready to defend it to the death, right? So right. that's where you see a lot of this emotional charge. And that happens on both ends, by the way. Right, absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah. Which is a nice um, uh, kind of uh, uh, lead in, for lack of better words, to or transition to next week's episode, which is about the hero's journey. Yes. Oh, so that's very major. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so join us there too. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, so. But again, you know, as with all of our episodes, again, all of this stuff is just another way. And yeah. so, you know, I'm just presenting Hashtag things as I see them and everybody can make up their own mind. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. one final quote from Nikola Tesla that, okay. that I definitely wanted to share would be, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all of the previous centuries of existence. So this is an exciting time. Yeah. Right? And we all, yeah. So we all get to decide if you are uh, even remotely on board with what I was just saying, you know, we all get to decide what we believe and then where we'd like to go in terms of our future, which is pretty cool. So. Yeah. And if we don't want to, it's still being developed. You know, I think enter people like Elon Musk, who's like, I don't give a shit if you're on board with me or not. Yeah, at this point, certainly in his career, you know, he's going to develop it anyways. So I think that I think it's it is starting to happen, which is pretty yes. exciting. Yeah, and I'm really and glad we have more people waking up to this. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And, and going I'm, up that uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Sure, yeah, As totally. individually and collectively. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, but one other thing that I just wanted to throw in here. Okay, we are over an hour, so just, you know. That's okay. Okay, because uh, this is this is good. So, okay. For those who might think, oh, this is just conspiracy theory, at the end of the day, you know what? There's no blame here because right. we can put ourselves in the shoes of that investor and why Why would I invest in this? Right. Where's my return, you know? But at the same time, uh, you know, it's time to do things differently on this planet because right. this type of thinking, yeah, otherwise we're just we're headed for destruction in terms of environmental degradation, mm -hmm. in terms of poverty and lack and perpetual struggle, mm -hmm. and then just perpetuation of war as we got into, you know, in our first episode in terms of the petrodollar system, mm -hmm. you know, this system that has been used to prop up the financial system, um, you know, 
but also just the permanent state of preventing these next paradigm ideas, these 5B ideas from taking hold because we're worried about having to charge each other for in parasiting energy off of each other in this closed loop system instead of tapping into that next realm where right. you know, it's all about self-sovereignty and it's all about self-sufficiency. So yeah, word. Anyway, but I'm um, really glad we did do this again, though, because I, I certainly didn't understand it. And so and it takes like you said, it takes it takes being open and it takes kind of um, dedication and to it, you and know, instead of exposure. Exactly. As well. And yeah. it and it starts to when you are open to it, it does start to materialize and then make sense a little bit as long as you are open to it instead of just shooting it down. So it right. is a journey. Um, and I think I think it's worth the journey. For sure, for sure. And there was one other quote that I wanted to leave with from Einstein who said, you know, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Right. So that's yeah. what we're talking about here. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a paradigm. Time to level, it's time to level up and access the new solutions that come with that individually and collectively. So, Absolutely. Cool. It is a paradigm shift and people have, uh, and we're all experiencing the paradigm shift with this whole virus thing. So it's like mm -hmm. now that we've kind of acknowledged that, oh, paradigm shifts are real. And this, I kind of understand what a paradigm shift is. Then it opens the door to being able to go even further. Like you said, with these other ideas, um, more paradigm, maybe paradigm reality, you know, yeah. Or whatever you call it. The, the like the fifth next paradigm. Yes. Yeah. Next paradigm. Yeah. New world. So. New world. Yeah. Cool. Anyway. So. Fantastic. Yes. We went, we went a little long, but totally worth it. This was awesome. And it's a heavy topic um, mm -hmm. and complicated. So thank you so much for packaging it in a way that really makes a lot of sense. This definitely landed for me. So thank cool. you. Um, thank you, so, Emelina. And yeah, thanks, everybody. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so please join us next week for the hero's journey. And uh, remember, there's always another way. True. <laughs> See you guys again. Bye.